Thank you. Uh, can you all hear okay? I'm going to begin with a short reading from uh, this is my book, War Torn. Uh, these are stories of the impact of war on civilians in different countries, Afghanistan, Iraq, Sri Lanka, Guatemala, elsewhere. I'm going to jump right into a story in Sri Lanka. Back at the hotel, I parked the motorbike and wandered down to the internet cafe across the way. A young man with a friendly smile waved me over. We'd seen each other in the cafe before, but never spoken. He introduced himself as Sampath and invited me to sit and share a glass of lemon gin. He was a sweet guy, a photographer. Couldn't have been more than 30 years old. He told me he was Sinhalese and had married a Tamil woman. That shouldn't matter, but in his view, it ended up getting her killed and turning him into a widower. Sampath said he and his wife were expecting a child some years ago. And during her last month of pregnancy, she traveled north to see her parents up in Jaffna. He said the Tamil Tigers decided to send a warning message about Tamils marrying Sinhalese. So they tied his wife to a signpost and cut open her belly, killing both her and the unborn child. He described this graphically, motioning with his hands to make sure I understood the, the gruesome nature of the murder. As he spoke, he looked into my eyes with a, an unsettling intensity to be sure I was listening. And then he, he gazed into the distance behind me, as if pulled into the terrible imagery that he'd just described. I found myself feeling thankful for the numbing effect the gin was having on my brain. I didn't want to picture the scene he'd painted, and the gin kept things blurry. Sampath continued with his story. He said he still woke up every night from nightmares about the child he never had the chance to see, his only memory and image of his butchered wife and the fetus she carried. The images won't stop, he said. It didn't matter whether he was awake or asleep. It had been 12 years and the gruesome pictures just wouldn't go away. I uttered some words of empathy, but he talked right past them. Didn't even seem to hear me. After the killing, he hit bottom. He wandered up to Goa, a former Portuguese colony that's become a, a hippie and a techno scene on the uh, northwest coast of India. There, he became addicted to anything that would numb the pain and dull the memories. He eventually found his way into a rehab center back in Sri Lanka in the beautiful mountain city of Kandy. And it was in Kandy that he met one of Golda Meir's grandsons. She was a former prime minister of Israel. Um, who invited him to come to Israel and spend some time on a kibbutz. It would, sounded appealing, a chance to connect with the land and with himself as well. In Israel, Sampath got his life together, then came back to Sri Lanka and started a photography business. It was really taking off, he said. Business was good, and he was feeling hopeful about the future for the first time in years. One night in December of 2004, he was shooting a wedding at the lighthouse a ritzy hotel on the south, co south coast, just off the Gaul Road, just a short distance from where we were talking. It was late when he finally was able to head home, so he left his gear in the hotel rather than carry it with him on his motorcycle. The tsunami hit that night, and the water destroyed everything, all of his equipment, Sisyphus and the boulder, a life rebuilt, taken down by a series of massive waves. We sat in silence for a few moments, listening to the sound of the waves breaking against the beach. He smiled in a genuine way that caught me by surprise. Who could, who could smile after what he'd been through, the story he'd just told? But he said, you have to keep smiling and see the glass is half full. It's the only way to survive. He'd gotten a new camera and had landed several gigs already. You've got to stay positive, he said. It's just those dreams. If I could stop those horrible images from entering my dreams, I'd, I'd be okay. Lying in bed later that night, I listened to the waves outside my window. The sounds of the sea have always been calming to me, a primal response to the rhythm of water. But this night, the ocean made me uneasy its destructive power barely hidden beneath the gentle sound of the waves. I couldn't stop thinking about it, the evening's conversation about the cruelty and terrible losses my friend in the cafe had endured. 
I'm not exactly sure how we come to terms with the effects of evil on our lives. A natural disaster isn't malicious. A tsunami doesn't intentionally cause harm. It simply happens indifferent to the destruction it creates and the despair it leaves in its wake. But to experience the death of a loved one killed with absolute intentionality, to be left with images of brutality and suffering, I wonder at times whether there can only be an imperfect healing, a coming to terms that leaves a thin scar over wounds that will always be tender. And yet, so many survivors of traumatic violence do seem to find ways of seeing the glass of life as half full. I continue to marvel at this will to not just survive, but to really live, to build anew, to regain one's faith in the better side of human nature. I've seen it everywhere my work has taken me. It's inspirational, like watching a flower grow out of concrete or break through the surface of snow. At times, it feels like witnessing something quietly profound, a kind of inner grace that springs from somewhere just beyond my comprehension. Sampath's story captures two themes, uh, loss and resilience, that are central to what I really want to talk about for the next few minutes, just three or four minutes. And that's the experience of refugees. Loss and resilience. What do refugees leave behind? What do they lose? Well, there's the interpersonal loss. The loved ones and friends killed in barrel bombs, shootings, shells. The violent losses we're familiar with, either because we've seen it, lived through it, or seen it on social media. It's what we think of when we think of war-related loss. The other set of losses are less tangible, less visible, the immaterial losses, but no less real, the loss of social roles, the loss of identity, roots, and the sense of belonging and being at home and life projects. Well, if we come to the first set of losses, the interpersonal losses, it surprises people, but refugees, like most folks, on the whole, on average, do pretty well. Refugees, the majority of them, go through their grief, they, they are bereaved, they go through the experience of loss, and they come out intact. The majority of refugees survive their experiences of loss, and they come out the other end okay. But about 20 to 30 percent of bereaved refugees, folks who've lost someone in war-related violence, particularly if the violence was gruesome and they witnessed it, remain stuck in their grief and their loss over months and even years. And the passing of time brings no comfort. This kind of prolonged grief uh, is something that doesn't get better naturally with the passing of time. But fortunately, traditional healing rituals as well as Western clinical treatments uh, have turned out to be remarkably effective at helping people get unstuck from this kind of uh, prolonged grief. And uh, again, it's about 20 to 30 percent of refugees who experience war-related loss will get stuck in that, but they can be helped. The other set of losses, the, the intangible losses, uh, are what account for so much of the high rates of depression we see in refugee communities. We often think, well, it must be the war that they've lived through. But as it turns out, if you want to understand depression, which is different than grief, uh, if you want to understand depression uh, among refugees, it's not so much what happened before they became refugees as the experience of living in exile, the loss of all those social roles and community and identity and roots. The good news about it is that it doesn't take rocket science to help people transcend those losses by creating new lives in exile. Uh, we can do remarkable things simply by helping people gain access to the resources they need to overcome these losses and begin to find new sources of meaning and hope and community wherever they're living. Uh, and I want to end by giving a very simple, brief example of that. There was a Bosnian woman at a clinic that I directed in Chicago years ago who was severely depressed and over months of psychotherapy and medication didn't improve at all. She lived in a small apartment with her grown-up son and his wife and they worked during the day and she spoke no English and so she remained in her apartment all day, isolated. 
Finally, her therapist, a young graduate student, decided to try a different approach. The two of them got on the city bus, which terrified her because she didn't know how to read the map, and they intentionally got lost together. And they ended up in some far-off part of Chicago, and her task, with his help, was to figure out how to get home. And every week, they got lost together, and every week she had to figure out the right subway and bus. Four weeks after this kind of treatment began, he called it bus therapy, her depression was gone. She was taking the bus to visit friends, to go to social activities, to join a women's group that she attended regularly, to go to the mosque, uh, and her depression had lifted. She was beginning to create a new life. I leave you with this thought. We, despite what clinicians will sometimes suggest, we're actually more resilient than we are fragile. But resilience doesn't reside solely inside the person. Resilience is an interaction of the strengths we each bring and the context that we're in. So when the context is supportive and helps people find the resources they need, their own resilience shines. The question for us in this age of horrible divisiveness over refugees here in Europe, in the Netherlands, in my country, the United States, the question is, what sort of context do we want to provide? Thank you.